All right, today, what are we doing? Today we're talking about brakes. Specifically, we're talking about disc brakes on your classic Ford. Now, if you want a disc brake kit, I'll tell you this right now, my pick is the one we're gonna be using today because it is literally the most complete brake setup I've seen in a while. It has everything in the box, and I am a big proponent of everything in the box. So, what we're gonna talk about today is tips and tricks on how to grease up bearings, how to set everything up, also, how to make it all look really spiffy and not squeak. Because if you're not careful, squeaking can be an issue right after this. Restoration of a classic Ford is a journey of discovery. Let Auto Crafters help you with yours. We offer quality parts for Falcon, Fairlane, F-Series, Galaxy, Maverick, and Pinto. Contact us today. Stainless Steel Brake Corporation went away, sadly, a couple of years ago. Uh, and then when they did, another company came in, bought the rights to the Stainless Steel Brake name, took the name and made it to Stainless Steel Brakes USA, and thus the new company was born. This has nothing to do with the old company. This is a brand new startup. They just took the remaining stock of things and the name itself modify the name a little bit. So if you go out and look for Stainless Steel Brake Corp, go out and look for Stainless Steel Brake Corp-USA.com. That'll get you right to their website that you can take a look at what they've got. Now, beyond all that, I picked this kit for the 65 Ranchero that we're working on because quite frankly, it is super complete. There is everything you need to put these brakes on a 1965 Ranchero or Falcon or even a 65 Mustang because they all would use the same style kit. So, one of the first things I'm gonna talk about with that is to do this. Read and follow your instructions. <laughs> I know, this seems really simplistic, but it's true. You really need to take these things, breeze through them initially, and then read them heartily, and then go use them whenever you are putting the car together, because instructions are important. We're here to give you further instruction because a lot of guys just don't wanna read just the way it is. Now, what I'm gonna talk about is a couple of cool things with this kit. One of the first things I really like about it is it comes with the proportioning valve. You don't have to go out and get this uh, after the fact or while you're working on the car. It actually is part of the kit. It comes with a dual reservoir master cylinder. If you are putting disc brakes on your car, go ahead and do the dual reservoir master cylinder. You'll be glad you did because if you do, you have the back section of the braking and I know that it looks like I'm pointing at the wrong spot. This is the reservoir for your rear brakes. You have this system split with a fruit bowl style master cylinder like the one I'm showing you right now. You do not. It is one big bowl and when all the fluid is gone, guess what? You ain't got no brakes. <laughs> so that's the bad thing. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop the top on this box if I can figure out how to get into it and talk about the rotors we're using. These are the stainless steel brake corp. Let's get out of the way. These are the stainless steel brake corp uh, slotted rotors. Now this is an optional rotor. It also has a zinc coating on it, which is kind of cool. So this is what you would use as an option on your car. The standard rotors that come with this kit are the flat rotors. So keep that in your mind when you're ordering. Don't be surprised if you don't get this and you just order the basic kit that has all of this and a couple of other things that <clears throat> just wouldn't, wouldn't fit on the table. So, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and get started on this bad boy, pull the Ranchero back into position because we are still in the middle of moving and there ain't no room. They just, they just ain't no room. All right, so real quickly before I go any further with all this, I wanted to show you my contraption here. This is uh, hard to move around if you're caught like we are. So you, you may get caught now because of all the things that are going on in the world with parts delays and things like that. So what we had to do in order to move this around inside the shop was we put this on a set of casters from the guys at Harbor Freight, went down and just bought them like everybody else, took the tire from the wheel, flipped it on the side that doesn't show humanity, and then put a blanket down and then set the car down on top of this. And what this does is, is it keeps this thing mobile inside the shop. All right, so the next thing I wanna to talk to you about is the importance of your spindles. Now these are a new set that we got from the guys at Auto Crafters. Uh, these are now available. I'm really happy to see them because at this stage in the game, the original Ford spindles are just trashed. 
A lot of them are in bad shape. Now there are some good ones out there, but I'm gonna tell you the things you need to look out for when you are doing this. Number one thing to look out for is where on the bottom side of this spindle here, where your bearing race runs. This is your race uh, area for your bearing. And then there's another wear area right here. And the critical spot on this one especially is the front section of this uh, spindle. This is where the outer race runs and this is the one that is on a smaller race. It's a smaller bearing and therefore it can cause a problem with these things being messed up. Now, I've seen people go in and repair these. That can be done as well. But the problem you run into with these kind of bearing lines is if this is worn a lot or even a little bit, your bearings are never going to seat correctly on the rotor or the, or the drum whenever you're doing your installation. So always check this, make sure that you've got the same diameter uh, on this all the way around. You can use a caliper to check it. You can caliper check this one, although I find typically that your rear bearing does not see the same level of wear as the front bearing sees. So this one is gonna be your more critical one to pay attention to. All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about grease because this is gonna be one of those things like motor oil, antifreeze, and a couple of other things. What is your preference? I am not going to tell you what grease to use. I am only going to tell you what grease I use. So I use Mobile One uh, and it is a synthetic grease. I like this stuff. It goes with all the NLGI that you need to have in order for it to be a good grease for using on axles and things like that. My experience with Mobile One has been really good. I have never had a problem with the product. I'm sure someone will, you know, please write into the comments below your bad experience with whatever product. But please also understand, I have never had an issue with this stuff. I've always used it. I will say this about Mobile One grease over Mobile One oil, which I also use. Mobile One grease does have a problem with leaking. And I don't know how to express this any other way than for some reason, if your grease gun sits in your tool drawer for a little while, the Mobile One will start to separate out the color that is in the, uh, in the grease itself because they put a color in there so you know that it's their grease and it will start to pee out of the, <laughs> of the grease gun for lack of any other better way to put it. So you will need to know that. I've never had a problem with it peeing out of the uh, inside of the rotors on the bearings, but in the drawer, it pees. It's, I guess if it's bored and it has nothing else to do, it's gonna piss all over your stuff. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grease the bearings on this assembly. They come ungreased, obviously. Um, what you're gonna be working with is a bearing just like this. Now there's two different ways to grease a bearing. There are bearing greasers that you can use and they will pack the bearing, but a lot of times I've also found is they'll put a lot of grease right down in here. And then what do you do with that grease once you're done? You're just gonna to have to take it and throw it away most of the time because if you're working out of a can like I am, you don't have anywhere to put it back into and you don't want to put it back into the tube because it could have become fouled with something inside of here. But before we go to that level, one of the things I'm going to do before I do anything else is test fit my bearing on the race to make sure that I got a good fit. If I have a good fit, then I know I'll be able to do that. So I'll test both front and rear. Very tight. There's a little bit of a gore on the spindle right around here that's preventing this from going on easily. This one is fine, everything fits good. Once it gets on the race, it's really nice. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to do as my dad always used to say, a dab a do you in that hand. I'm gonna grab my bearing. I'm gonna take the bearing with the cage side, the open cage side out. And I'm going to just grab grease all the way around and shove it up into the bearing area. Now you may have to do two or three dab to get it to roll up in there. I'm also going to come in from the top a little bit to get grease down inside of it from that direction as well. And I'm flat facing it on the top because that's going to be the easiest way to get some grease in there. 
one of the jobs that I absolutely hate doing is greasing bearings. And I know that the other style that I'm showing you right now works you know, just as well. I just prefer to do it this way because I can get my hands on it and I can make sure I'm happy with what I'm getting for grease inside of the bearing area. I'm going to do this a couple of times and I'm going to try to roll the bearing around as well, grabbing the cage because <laughs> it's greasy, it's not going to move, and rolling the bearings in here. My old arthritic hands really don't enjoy this activity much. Be a good idea to not drop it at this point, especially if you've got a grimy, rock infested driveway. Now, there's other things that have to happen before we can put this all together. And so you're like, oh no, what do I do with the bearing while I'm waiting? Well, they come in bags. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to move this bearing off here just a second. I'm going to take this and just throw it in the bag, even though my fingers are greasy. And this is really more about keeping the bearing uncontaminated than it is about anything else. Again, you're just going to jaw that in there. I'm going to eat grease. Not a dab, but do you? So much fun. But I'll throw a little more grease on the outside, and I'm going to talk about something to do with the rotors here in just a second. Now, what I'm doing now is something I read in a Timken piece for big trucks. I don't really know if it applies to this thing. I'm going to grease this. Then I'm going to grease the inside of the, the cap that retains everything and keeps the grease inside. All right, trust me, doing this, you are probably going to get grease on the rotor. You can use a bunch of different things to clean the grease off. You can use brake parts cleaner. That works great. You can also use a little bit of lacquer thinner to get that off as well. It'll work just fine. It'll get rid of the grease and it'll, it'll knock it completely out of the way. The next thing I'm going to talk about is something I read in the Timken book, which I'm now getting grease all over, <laughs> all over the tube. And in the Timken stuff I read, they tell you to put grease around the inside of the rotor. And I've never done this before, but I figure if Timken tells you, it's probably a good idea to make that happen. Won't hurt anything getting any grease in any of the other areas. This could also be a good way to just, if there's anything coming up off of there, to pick up any of that debris so it doesn't infect anything else toward the back if it's in the front section. All right, uh, I am now going to go and put my race or my uh, seal in. Sometimes these can, things can be a kind of a pain to get the seat because they'll tend to go out on one end or the other when you're putting them in. Like that. What I'm doing when I'm doing this is I'm actually feeling around to see where it's raised up at. It's really not a good idea to get gorilla with it because you can kink there. You can kink this inside edge and you won't have a good seal. That's why I'm using a fairly small hammer. You hear that? That side seating. It's a different tone. Your seal is now seated in the rotor. All right, so you got the bracket for the uh, actual caliper. Round portion of the bracket goes toward the top. The caliper mounting positions go toward the inside of the car. So that goes on first. It sets in place. And then you get your uh, splash shield, that's one of the things I like about the SSBC kit is, is it does come with splash shields and I like those for a lot of road use. If you're going to be driving the car a good bit, which you may or may not, 
having the splash shields is nice because there's going to be road debris, oil, grease that can get on the inside of the rotors on some other kits that don't have the splash shields on it and it just makes things a little bit messier. Uh, especially if you're in water. If you're going through some water and there's water splashing around up underneath the chassis, the splash shields will help reduce the amount of water that hits the actual uh, rotor and can cause you to have some brake issues. So I'm going to put this on here now. This is where the fun starts because you have to kind of mate these things up together. And then get them to line into the hole. Must be smiling right or something today because that one's already started right. I don't know what's going on. That shouldn't work that well at all. Now, one other thing I want to talk about real quickly is there's a longer bolt that comes with the kit. Make sure that you don't say, oh no, I didn't get enough bolts to put things, this thing together because the, the four, there's not four short bolts. You have three short bolts and one long bolt, and the long bolt goes in the back section right by the tie rod end over here. In other words, your tie rod end assembly, the bolt for this longer goes in back there. And you have another bolt, obviously, that goes in the front. And then you have four nuts. Now, these are 9 16 fasteners. Am I going to tighten these suckers down right now? I am not. And the reason for that is, is I may have to monkey around with positioning of the splash shield uh, in order to get this thing so it sits the way it's supposed to on the car. I will put the caliper on and test fit next. Where are you, little fastener? All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to test fit the caliper to make sure they're going to fit nicely with the splash shield. This is just one of those little additional things that you want to do so that you don't find yourself going, oh crap, down the road. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the caliper up and I'm going to put a bolt through it. All right, I got my three quarter here. I'm going to thread these bolts in. I'm going to take them to full tight because that's what you're going to want to do. And you. What you're looking for is an interference problem between the caliper and the shield. We're pretty good right now, but I want to make sure this thing goes on all the way before I sign off on it, so to speak. All right, here's a little tip for you. You can throw a screwdriver, flat blade screwdriver, in between the caliper and the shield to pop it up a little bit more and roll it around, and now we are about even on top and bottom. Then you go in and tighten up the uh, 9 16 fasteners on the spindle itself. You get one tight, usually that'll be enough to hold it in place. And just go around and tighten all four of these. You can do something like a star pattern and all that, but I wouldn't recommend it. What I will do after I pull the calipers off is I'm going to go in and actually uh, torque these to torque spec on the sheet. And I'm not going to tell you what that is, so you'll go look at the instructions. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the rotor on. Now I've got some grease on the back side of this rotor. I'm not gonna do anything to this thing until I can clean it uh, after I get it mounted up. But right now I'm gonna be doing some dirty stuff, so be real careful installing the rotor. And this is where we had that bearing issue before. So, oh, that's nice. Grease is stuck to it. Put my bearing on here. Ew. Now I've got my washer which goes into a slot here and I have a castellated nut which goes on last. Now off camera I torqued those four bolts to proper torque spec. All right, now I'm going to go get my wrench and do the tightening sequence on this. I've shown you this before in another video. But I'm going to go ahead and do my tightening sequence for the bearing. Rolls pretty nice right there, but I want to go ahead and seat the bearings and then see what we get. Like all of this mess, it's all got to go. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go in and actually set the rotor in position. Right now, this is finger tight. It shouldn't be finger tight. 
There should be just a little bit of tension on here. What you're supposed to do is to go just a little beyond it to where it tightens up and that's a little too tight and then back it off till you get free rotation. You don't hear any grindy grind. The problem with this method is sometimes the hole in the spindle is not matching up with your position. And such is the case that we're starting to work with here. I'm going to take my cotter pin and see if I can get it to install here. No. Probably going one way and not the other. Either direction. I'm afraid if I can get it to go there, we may be a little too loose. I guess not. It seems to be running fine. That's probably where I would set it. Um, your bearings are now seated, so you're in a good position there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some uh, brake clean. We just got this stuff at the local auto parts store. And I'm going to clean the rotors down with a lint-free cloth, theoretically. I have a hard time finding lint-free cloths these, uh, these days. I always use gloves when I'm doing this kind of stuff. These are actually, because they've been zinc washed, they're actually really pretty clean compared to a lot of what I've seen coming out of... Uh, some of the shops, like if you're getting them from, getting rotors from an auto parts store, they're usually a lot dirtier than these seem to be right now. The biggest problem I'm seeing is the grease that I put on there. <laughs> Accidentally. And what you're doing with this is you're trying to get all the contaminants off the face of the rotor before you apply your pads. I always put my pads on with, yeah. See, that's really not that bad at all. I always try to put my pads on with gloves on because I don't want to get my finger grease on the rotors or the pads so I don't foul those. Now, you may wonder why I don't have the cap on yet. Um, I'm not gonna do that again until I get to a final point with this thing where I'm happy with the entire install and then I'll put the cap on. One thing I'll say about these caps, some of the caps today are not really well fitting and you may fight them. I have a friend who actually goes to the salvage yard and looks for really nice, decent, original caps to use on his cars because some of the new ones just aren't fitting like they should. Your little caveat emptor there. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put the caliper on and then I'll load the pads in. The thing about the Kelsey Hayes setup like this is it was supposedly a racing caliper. So this was designed that you could quick change the pads out if you needed to out in the field, so to speak, at a race. So I'm going to set them up and put them on here like I had them before. Top bolt started because it's just easier to do. Get that one's first. All right, I got the top one mounted. I'll put the bottom one in. Screw them in. <laughs> what I'm doing when I'm looking down into the calipers, I'm trying to make sure that we have a good even mounting that we have the same space on both sides of the caliper. So far we're looking pretty good. These will also need to be torqued to spec. Look at your instruction sheet. Now the reason I wear gloves is like I said before, whenever I'm putting this kind of stuff together, it's just a lot easier. This is the back side of your pad. This is the side of the pad that faces toward the rotor. I know 99.9% .9 of you guys are, are going to know that, but there are the guys that have not ever done this before that want to attempt this for the first time, so I'm doing that for them. Add inserts in here, like that. And they're in. And then you have a plate that is like this, that sits here, and it has two pieces, these two pieces here and here, keep the pad fully planted in the on the rotor. Mm. 
And you've got two stainless bolts with washers. Actually, I don't think these are stainless. They're probably regular steel. I'm going to start that one, and I'll put the other one in in a second. And then the bottom one, it's a little more fun because you're having to overcome these two pieces. And when you're wearing gloves, it's even more fun. I don't know if that's going in or not. It was. All right, now one thing I will say that kind of bums me out about the Kelsey Hayes is you have to take the wheel off to bleed the brakes if you want to bleed them afterwards. Like if you do a job, you have to go in and bleed the brakes. You have to take the wheel off because your brake bleeder screw, say that three times fast, is on the outside of the wheel here rather than being on the inside like it is on a lot of earlier things. But that's it. That's basically the brakes going on our 65 Ranchero for now. I am not going to finalize everything like I said because A, I don't have the brake lines. I have to detail the engine bay on this side and we need to get the brake lines in from the guys at Auto Crafters in order to finish this up and run the brakes to here. Plus I got to paint all of it. In any case, do me a favor and go out and check out our Patreon account. The $5 a month level, you get monthly meetings with me on Zoom. And that's not just you and me, that's me, you, and a bunch of other people. And honestly, it's some of the most fun you're probably going to have because everybody kicks in and everybody talks and chats and we have a ball. Um, we do tech questions and Q&A and things like that on there. We are also going to start doing one video a month for Patreon guys only. That does not affect anything we do with Auto Resto Mod or Manic Mechanic because the guy behind the camera over here is going to be doing the edit on those freeing me up to do all the stuff that I've been doing all along. Really, it's just a thank you to the guys that are over there on Patreon supporting us financially on a monthly basis. We do appreciate what you guys are doing. Another thing you need to do, though, is to go out and subscribe to the channel. Now, more than ever, that is important because YouTube has re-algorithmed yet again. So it's a little different now, and subscriptions aren't necessarily important to YouTube still, but they are very important to you and me because it will let you know if you're a subscriber when we have fresh content coming up because theoretically you should be either notified on YouTube or in an email, and I'm pretty sure they come in on an email, what's going on. The bell that's there, it's over on the side. Just click the bell for notification. You'll be able to know what's happening. If you just subscribe, you're not going to know anything. I mean, you'll know things, but you're not going to know about us. Finally, folks, and all, be good to each other, be kind to each other, and love on each other. You guys have a great week, and we'll see you on down the road. So many things. And I really want to do more. Like, so many things we need to do. And I need to do a battery tray. I mean, this is not a, this is not a want to. It actually needs to be done. There's a big hole there that needs to be gone. And nobody makes this battery tray yet. That's one thing that just really kills me. Maybe we'll do a video on parts that we'd like to see that we ain't seen yet. Let me know in the comments below. Do you want to see a video on things that we ain't seen yet that we need to see? On Falcons, Fairlanes, Torino's Oh My? You guys have a great week. <laughs>